I must tell you that from my earliest encounter with words, I was enamored by each impartation I heard. I must tell you that religiously, I searched dictionaries and encyclopedias for what truths they might hold. And I confess, my friend, that some evenings my mother would tuck us in, and once leaving, I would pull from under my pillow whatever book I was reading, only seeing what the hall light would permit, and the rest was lit by a child's imagination. I must tell you that on such occasions, worlds were opened unto me. For I dreamed of days in Paris and nights in Madrid, of block parties under streetlights in Harlem, and how cool it would be if they had them down south where I lived. A thousand possible what-ifs flooded my mind. In time, I became so inclined to history, I could just picture me down through the centuries. I saw Rome rise and fall. I saw Jesus, Nazareth, and Muhammad's Mecca. And being a child, I was enthralled by it all. I could plainly see Martin Luther, his back to us in every text that we read, standing on the chapel steps, nailing his 95 theses into history. And I rehearsed every verse of Lincoln's address at Gettysburg, only to learn not a soul was freed by its words. And sometimes you can't always believe what you heard. And I was amazed at how easily leaving me out of history could be. How easily people could believe what they read, take up arms, and fight for the very lie they were deceived by. It was as if the scales were falling from my eyes and I, too, wanted to fight. But I tell you today that only a coward fights with a sword at her side. And so some die, thinking themselves courageous. But I will fight with my pen. For it is the biggest stick I've ever carried when we stay married in truth. I tell you, I write. I write because we live in dangerous times. I write because I am still young enough to believe I can save the world with my rhymes. I write because I've got something to say. I write because the world is too big and I am too small to be heard any other way. I write so that someday, somewhere, people like you and me will finally be free to see all the what-ifs that we have always dreamed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Erica Galt, and I am one half of the partnership of Njozi Ensemble Company, an arts-based organization that seeks to bring awareness to African and African-American history and culture through the arts. The poem that I just recited for you is part of my own journey. Uh, from awareness to writing, from critique to developing conscious art. And I began that journey when I was about your age. In our society today, critique and criticism are something that we are often inundated with. Think about it, from talk shows to the comment section on your favorite YouTube video. Think about the most popular Twitter post uh, that you read this week. Everyone has an opinion, and everyone is a critic. And criticism isn't necessarily a bad thing. Criticism, critique, is actually what is called a high-order thinking skill in Bloom's taxonomy. According to Bloom, we began at that very basic level, the acquisition of knowledge. We start off by remembering information, like 2 plus 2 equals... We all know that. And over time, we should be building skills that actually move up Bloom's taxonomy so that we're able to analyze information, evaluate or critique or provide criticism. But along with that ability that we have to evaluate, humans hold the joint capacity to also create. And the kind of art we choose to create is really quite essential. Do you all remember a couple of years ago, a song came out entitled Blurred Lines? Top the charts. It was held as a new and innovative work. But it depends on who you ask. 
According to the family of Marvin Gaye, there was really nothing new about this song at all. Instead, it had borrowed from an earlier song. But think about it. What the creators of Blurred Lines were guilty of, how often is a lot of the art that we see guilty of the same thing? From plays, to movies, to TV shows, to popular novels and books, how often do you read, hear, listen to, or watch something that is truly innovative? How much of what we see is actually quite formulaic when it comes to art? The kind of art that I am talking about today is authentic art, that while it may be inspired by other art, is not simply a reproduction or an imitation of that art or life itself. I am also not talking about art that may be deconstructive, meant to be divisive, satirical, or just downright disrespectful. This was the critique of Pope Francis of the work of Hebdo magazine. So I'm arguing for constructive art, consciousness-raising art. This kind of authentic and constructive art is demonstrative of what Gustavo Guterres called the liberated consciousness. This liberated consciousness, if you will, speaks to art, literary, performative, visual, you name it. Art that is armed with the task of not only critiquing the government or social injustice, but art that seeks to create a new way of thinking and existing, to construct a better world, a place where all are free, especially the oppressed. And now, I know there may be some critics in the room, and you're saying to yourself, isn't that a whole lot to ask of art? But I would contend that art must be an emancipatory project. Art must be about freedom, both for the audience as well as the artist. For it offers one of the greatest counter-narratives to the oppression that many are facing in our world today. It was this kind of literary art that first ignited my dreams of days in Paris and nights in Madrid, of block parties under streetlights in Harlem, and how cool it would be if they had them down south where I lived. A thousand possible what-ifs flooded my mind. What if we had art that was concerned not only with what is, but began to imagine what if? And I believe that you all in this room have the greatest capacity for the creation of that kind of art, and I'll tell you why. When it comes to computer and internet technology, you have unprecedented access. Here's a snapshot of the statistics from the Pew Research Center. 93%. That's the number of American teens between 12 and 17 who have computer access. Three out of four have internet access. And close to half of you in this room, close to half of all American teens, 47% own a smartphone. That is actually an incredible amount of power. That means that you have access to technology that the last generation could only dream of. I mean, come on, think about it. Wikipedia alone, a clearinghouse of information. You don't have to wait for the encyclopedia salesman to knock on your door. You probably don't even know what that reference means. And that <laughs> means that you have access, okay? <laughs> so on this bottom level of knowledge, the acquisition of information, remembering information, your generation is killing it. But isn't it time that we began to move up Bloom's ladder to not only holding the information, but also creating something quite meaningful, something authentic and conscious that helps the world around us? And here's a model on how you can accomplish that and three very easy steps. The very first one is to define the problem. It seems simple enough, but there are a myriad of issues that you have the ability to tackle. Pick just one that's very important to you. It can be important to you because it is part of your experience or your friends or your family, 
or something that you read about or learned, but what issue would you like to tackle? And then through a process that Paulo Ferri calls conscientionization, began to develop a deeper awareness of the issue past a surface assessment. A surface assessment would be something like, isn't it really bad what happened in Ferguson, Missouri? However, conscientionization goes beyond that, investigating the systemic and sustained issues of racial inequity that existed in Ferguson, Missouri, long before the shooting death of Michael Brown. About five years ago, my husband and I actually began this process for ourselves of defining the problem. We felt that when it came to the stories of African-American women, uh, we were often disturbed by what we were seeing in mass media. We felt she was often sexualized and trivialized on television shows. Historically, she was often rendered invisible. And so we spent some time reflecting on the problem as it was. I thought of my own experiences as an African-American woman. For my husband, that meant drawing on the experiences he had had living in community and in a family uh, with African-American women. We also engage historical texts, asking some questions about what her struggle looked like historically, and looking for the sites where she had struggled to redefine herself and gain her own freedom, from the Tulsa race riots, to the Middle Passage, to the Second Middle Passage, the movement of African slaves uh, from the South uh, to the West. We began to look at what her story really meant. And then we moved on to the second step of identifying the groups who were involved. Well, of course, that meant the black women whose stories we hope to tell. But that also meant the audience that ultimately we wanted to engage. How did we want to tell this story of African-American women? We then moved on to the last step, which is to construct a what if, and to ultimately, because this assignment always is about getting to freedom, to figure out how we could follow that through to freedom. We asked the question, what if we began in the present and it was possible to walk back through the stories of African-American women, looking for the places where they had found their freedom and themselves? At the end of the day, our whole hope was that the audience could engage with a theater piece that asked them to reconsider how we have thought about the role of African-American women in our society and historically what she has meant to the, to the history of America. And this aided us in doing that. We went all the way back, and by the time we were finished, we had developed a body of poems, and this became a theater piece. And the images that you're seeing are from some of the actresses who actually assisted us in this project. That became a theater piece by the name of Ain't She Brave. Now in its fourth year of production, we've been quite successful in not only telling our story, which we thought was really important, and the story of African American women, but also engaging an audience on issues about freedom and what society could really look like if the folks at the margins not only got a chance to tell their stories, but also were working towards freedom and assisting others in that process. So again, I define the problem, identify the groups involved, and construct a what if, and follow it through towards freedom. In conclusion, I get it. There's still some critics out there. And you could be saying, why not create art for art's sake? Why does it always have to have an agenda or become political? Why make art into propaganda? To which I answer in the words of W.E.B. Du Bois in the critique of Negro art. He said, and I quote, all art is propaganda and ever must be, despite the wellings of the purest. I stand in utter shamelessness when I say that any art I have for writing has been used always for gaining the rights of black folk to love and enjoy. I do not care for any art that is not propaganda, but I do care when propaganda is confined to one side while the other is stripped and silent. 
The liberated artist understands that too much is at stake when we create art. And we do not have the luxury of not saying something meaningful with our art. For me, the lives of black women and black people are at stake. And if we do not speak meaningful to their situation, then Black Lives Matter is just a hashtag. I ask you today, what matters to you? What kind of world do you envision? Don't just critique. I challenge you to begin to create art that is authentic and consciousness raising so that someday, somewhere, you and I will live to see all the what ifs that we have always dreamed. Thank you.